So today we're going to wrap up this study by reviewing uh, Matthew's final chapters where Jesus the King uh, wins the great victory over death and turns authority over to His apostles. Now last time we saw uh, Jesus prophesy about the eventual, you know, He talked about the eventual destruction of uh, Jerusalem um, and uh, uh, they would suffer this destruction because of uh, their rejection of Him as well as you know, the prophecy for His eventual return at the end of the world. You know, complicated passage, but we kind of worked our way through it last time. Of course, uh, him saying this might have sounded a little far-fetched at the moment. If you were walking around the temple area at, the, at that time when he said, you know, all these buildings be torn down, you'd have a hard time believing that. The magnificent temple, the walls, you know, everything had been uh, finished, just built. But his words would grow in importance once he proved his claims uh, by uh, the resurrection from the dead. All right, now a lot of writers and commentators have referred to the last hours of Jesus' life, including his torture and crucifixion. They use the word passion, the passion of the Lord. Okay? So I'm going to use that because that one word kind of encompasses all of these ideas. All right, it's a lot easier to refer to that last period of time uh, using just one word. And so like the other three gospel writers, Matthew devotes the final portion of his uh, written record to the passion and resurrection of Jesus. And like Mark, uh, he adds his, the uh, commission that Jesus gives to the, um, to the apostles. So the passion is divided into three uh, sections. First of all, the final hours with the apostles, uh, chapter 26, verses 1 to 56. The time with the apostles included several scenes. First scene was the anointing, of course. The woman anoints Jesus' head with costly perfume. This was at the same time uh, a gesture of honor and respect and also prefigure. We remember we talked about types and things like that prefiguring his death as his body is being prepared for the grave. And then uh, this was done as Jesus ate with the disciples at the house of Simon the leper in uh, Bethany. And then the act moved, this particular act of you know, uh, anointing him, this moved Judas to make an arrangement with the Jewish leaders to find a place and a time convenient for them to uh, arrest him. And then the next scene in the, you know, the final hours with the apostles, the next scene is the Lord's Supper. The period of the year that this was happening, of course, the Passover, when thousands of Jews from all over the world converged on Jerusalem to celebrate this, uh, this religious feast. Uh, they would uh, offer a lamb as sacrifice and then gather together to eat the Passover meal. And they were doing this, of course, in remembrance of the time they were liberated from Egyptian slavery many years before. So Jesus and the apostle, good Jews, <coughs> excuse me, good Jews, they shared the Passover meal uh, just as Jews had done for, for uh, many, many, uh, many years. But of course, near the end of this meal, Jesus institutes a new meal, a new supper, if you wish. From that day forward, he told his disciples, they would share the Lord's Supper of bread and, and wine or fruit of the vine to commemorate His death on the cross to save them from the slavery of sin. So they were, the Passover was you know, to celebrate freedom from the slavery in Egypt. The Lord's Supper was a remembrance to uh, mark the time that Jesus freed uh, all men who you know, accepted Him uh, from the slavery to sin. So there was to be no more sacrificing of the lamb because he was the final sacrifice for sin. You know, John the Baptist said, you know, behold the lamb of God. That's what he was talking about, the sacrifice for sin. There was to be no more bitter herbs. That was part of the meal. The bitter herbs, if you wish, uh, to remind them of their bitter experience of slavery. No more taking of that, only the bread and the wine. From now on, the leavened bread would represent his pure and broken body on the cross and the fruit of the vine would represent his blood shed for sin, the atonement. 
And so the entire experience would now commemorate their freedom from sin to a promise of, eternal, of an eternal home in heaven. You know, the Passover also reminded them that they had been pro promised a land of their own. Uh, the communion reminds us that we also have a promise, not of a land or territory, of course, but a promise of a new heavenly home. And then Gethsemane, third, you know, the third act in the final hours with the apostles, third event, uh, they go to a garden outside the city walls of Jerusalem, and at this place Jesus struggles with his human nature. A lot of people say, well, why is he struggling? Well, you know, he was human. Yes, he was the Son of God, but he was fully, fully human. And so his human nature is recoiling at the thought of what he's going to have to face. And I think that would be normal. I mean, any human being thinking of the torture and the death that, that was facing him, no, no one in their right mind as a human being would look forward to something like that. We would naturally try to back off. And so we see his, his human nature struggling with, the, um, uh, with, the, uh, with difficulty at this thought. Of course, in the end, the apostles are with him, but they're not much help because they're weary and they're sorrowful and they're asleep. The final scene shows the Lord uh, coming to grips with the horror before him, and as he does, J uh, Judas the traitor arrives to betray him into the hands of the Jewish authorities, and the apostles scatter just as Jesus said they, they would. So what's interesting about these events is that each one of them contains a prophetic element about the death to come. You know, the anointing for the burial, the supper for remembrance, and the garden of suffering and surrender. And note that in each instance, the Lord is preparing Himself and especially His apostles for the death that He's going to endure in the days to come. All right, so that's the final hours with the apostles. The next you know, section uh, uh, are the trials, chapter 26. I'm not reading this, just too long to read in our class. That's why I'm kind of just summarizing the events in the order in which they, uh, they took place. Jesus had several trials or hearings which were organized in unlawful ways. They were all, the, all the things, all the trials and hearings were unlawful. They were, they were done at night and uh, they were done without all the leaders present, which was, against, uh, which was against the rules and the laws for trials. Of course, the purpose was not to determine the truth these show trials were conducted to provide a reason or a charge which, uh, with which uh, uh, Jesus could be executed. So Matthew, he describes two of them. There were more, but Matthew only describes two. One, the trial before Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the, uh, uh, the high priest at the time, and Jesus was first brought to him from the garden after the betrayal by Judas. And here he's, uh, he's mocked and baited by those assembled. They have no charge as one witness after another contradicts himself. You know, they can't get their act together here. Finally, out of desperation, Caiaphas simply asks Jesus directly if he thinks he's the Messiah. You know, go to the source. And of course, Jesus cannot deny himself. He can't deny himself, can't deny the claim, and in so doing, he gives Caiaphas the charge that he so desperately is looking for, and that is blasphemy. You know, they're, look, blasphemy is, is, a, is a, a, a capital offense, according to the Jews, to claim to be God. Okay. So under Jewish law, blasphemy was punishable by death, but while they were under the Roman rule, the Jews did not have the civil or legal authority to carry out the death penalty. Only the Romans could do that. Um, and so they were kind of in a bind here. But at least they had a charge. They had something to charge him with. The next trial, if you wish, hearing, if you wish, that Matthew describes is the one before Pilate. So they bring Jesus before Pilate, hoping to persuade him to carry out the death penalty that they've levied on Jesus. Pilate, in explaining Jesus, or rather in examining Jesus, he doesn't find anything under Roman law to justify the execution of this man. You know, he, you know I'm ready to execute you, but at least give me, you know, work with me here. You know, have you killed somebody? Have you done something? On the contrary, the more he speaks with Jesus, the more he wants to release him. Even Pilate's wife appeals to him to let the Jewish person or prisoner go, having had a dream about him. So Pilate even tries to exchange Jesus for a notorious murderer, but to no avail. The Jews, the Jews are adamant. 
Finally, when he sees that the Jewish leaders are fomenting a riot over the issue, he relents, he permits the execution to go forward. So the release of one innocent Jew was not worth the trouble of a riot that could cause problems for him, for Pilate. Politically, he was already on kind of you know, delicate ground, politically, so he didn't need any trouble. The, the way that he moved ahead in his career was keeping things quiet. No problems, no trouble. Now, in both trials, no proof or credible charge was made, no guilt was found, no crime was committed, and no justice was meted out. So Jesus was falsely accused, he was illegally tried, he was improperly sensed and brutally executed for being who he really was. That's the irony of the thing. Anytime you know, there's a, little, there's a lesson, you know, it's crying out to be you know, said. Anytime we feel unjustly treated or underappreciated or falsely accused, just compare it to what they did to the one who was completely innocent and without sin. And that you know, kind of helps you get things into perspective. You know, if somebody says something that's not quite fair to you, you know, think of what they did to the, to the Lord and it'll, it'll help uh, smooth over things. Okay, another scene, the crucifixion and the burial. Matthew continues to describe the passion in the third section of his narrative by relating the events of Jesus' crucifixion and burial. So there's the crucifixion itself, Roman crucifixion was merciless and excruciating and deadly, so much so that a Roman citizen was not allowed to be put to death in this way. It was too brutal. It was too shaming. It was reserved only for the worst criminals, for slaves and for foreign, foreigners, people uh, of other nations that they captured. So Matthew doesn't provide a whole lot of detail about the crucifixion itself, but rather he spends more time describing the reaction of people who were present at the cross. That's what's interesting about his gospel. He's looking at, he's looking at the people who are looking at Jesus and what they're doing. So for example, the soldiers, they gambled for his clothing. Uh, the crowd, they were mocking him, mocking his helplessness. The Jewish leaders were taunting him. Yeah, if you're so good, come on down. Let's see, come on, big guy, big prophet. Come on, show us what you got. And the criminals crucified on either side of him were insulting him. And of course, we know that one of them later repents. Matthew also describes the unusual things that took place once Jesus actually died. For example, the veil in the temple that separated you know, the the holy place from the holy of holies, right? That, that curtain there was split in two, very significant to demonstrate that, that that entranceway where only the high priest could enter once a year, that had been opened once and for all. Access to God is the symbolism there. Finally had been opened for everyone. Uh, the earth shook. Uh, some were raised from the dead who had been disciples and believers and who had died uh, during the ministry of Jesus. One of the centurions who had uh, participated in the crucifixion was converted on the spot. And Jesus' female disciples gathered together to witness His final moments. So with this scene unfolding, Matthew also describes the fact that above His head on the cross was a sign that said, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. The Romans had put it there to annoy and humiliate the Jews. The Jews had objected and wanted Pilate to write, he said, I am the king of the Jews. And we read about that, not in Matthew actually, in, in John chapter 19. Thus putting the humiliation on Jesus and not themselves. But Pilate was adamant and the sign remained as it was originally written. So despite the lies and the disbelief, what was written above the head of the Lord as a form of mockery was in the end the exact truth of what was taking place. They had crucified the king of the Jews. So the Jews, in collaboration with the Roman authorities, had executed their own Messiah and had done it through the hand of pagans. It's one thing if they would have killed him, but they had it done through the hands, through, you know, through the agency of a pagan army, which just, you know, <laughs> times a thousand, you know, the sin times a thousand. Then there's the burial. Again, I'm just you know, working my way through what Matthew talks about, the burial itself. 
He goes on to describe the scene as Joseph of Arimathea and Mary Magdalene prepared the body for burial. There were others who participated, but Matthew only mentions these two. He also describes how the Jews, knowing of Jesus' prophecies concerning His resurrection, they go to Pilate to make sure that the tomb is properly guarded. You know, and so Pilate permits them to do this, double up the guard, and he puts a seal on the stone so there would be no tampering, no switching of bodies, but a, 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 you know, they didn't want a look-alike of Jesus you know, popping up somewhere and saying, look, I've, I'm resurrected. So they, they really wanted to secure the grave. Uh, and for Matthew, this is the final scene leading up to the glorious event where Jesus will provide insurmountable proof to confirm His claim as King of the Kingdom of God in heaven, as well as on earth. All right, so now we move to the resurrection. We're going to read a couple of passages here in Matthew 28. So the resurrection of Jesus begins, Matthew 28, verse one, it says, now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. So it was early Sunday morning, as several of his female disciples come with the hope of finishing the burial procedure that they couldn't do because he died too near the Sabbath. So we continue on. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. So Matthew describes what happened before the women had arrived that morning. The angel's presence had caused an earthquake when he rolled the stone away. The angel appeared as a man, and they always do in the Bible. Angels never appear as children or they never appear as, uh, as women in the Bible, always as, always as men. Uh, Matthew describes the angel in terms of bright light, which is common for spiritual beings to be described this way. You know, in the, uh, in the Transfiguration, Jesus describes Jesus as you know, bright light, light emanating from Him, all right? The guards faint, they were afraid, and here's another point. Not only were they afraid, but in the scheme of things, they were unworthy to witness the resurrection. You know? I mean, Jesus is not going to appear to pagans. They had their chance. They saw the miracles, they saw, you know, they heard the teaching and so on and so forth. He doesn't reward them with the vision of the resurrection. So these, these men here, they faint. In verses five to seven, we read the angel uh, said to the women, do not be afraid for uh, I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified, he is not here. For he has risen just as he said, come see the place where he was lying, and go quickly, tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So the, the angel instructs the women as to what happened and what they, what they should do. They continue on, verse eight, nine, it says, and they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples, and behold, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. And so on their way to do what Jesus, you know, what the angel told them, Jesus appears to them and they worship him as the king, as the king. Remember this whole series, is. Jesus, King of the Kingdom, now He receives worship as the King. He also repeats the instructions of the angel who originally received them from the Lord uh, anyway. So we keep reading, verse 11. Now while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, you are to say His disciples came by night and stole Him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. So Matthew describes the scene where the Jewish leaders construct a story to explain the disappearance of the body and the amazing experience of the soldiers. It is interesting to note that Matthew credits this story as something that was still being used by the Jews as a way to discredit the resurrection, 
even some 30 years later when Matthew was writing and circulating his, uh, his gospel. But Jesus has risen and the tide of human history will now change forever as a new king is crowned to rule over the kingdom that God has established here on the earth in place of the evil ruler that held the power of death over people. In other words, one uh, one king ascends and another ruler descends. Satan who ruled, who had power, is destroyed and the new king uh, takes, not his place, but takes his proper place, the kingdom, the king of the kingdom. And so only one royal duty remains to uh, Jesus and that is the commission. Now that he is, uh, Jesus' position as the savior king has been established by fulfilled prophecy, right? The prophets said that the Messiah and the true king of God's people would provide proof of his identity by resurrecting from the dead. We need to remember that. The proof that Jesus is the king of the kingdom of God in heaven and on earth isn't just that he did miracles. I mean, prophets did miracles. You know, through Moses, you know, the sea was divided. Uh, 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 the pro Elijah you know, raised somebody from the dead. You know what I'm saying? The prophets did all the miracles. The one defining act that pointed to Jesus as the divine Messiah was that He resurrected from the dead. None of the prophets resurrected from the dead. Now some of them you know, went straight to heaven. You, you, you know, they, they bypassed death and God took them straight up. Okay, fine. But they didn't come back. See, there's a, there's a big difference there. So this was the final proof of His identity as King and Savior. So in Romans chapter 1 verse 4, Paul writes of Jesus, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Romans chapter one, verse four. And I remember a couple of lessons back, I think I quoted this and I, I inverted it as I was going over my notes. I said Romans 4, one. So I'm correcting that in this lesson. It's actually Romans chapter one, verse four, in case you've been looking, up that, uh, looking for that particular verse. But that's the defining thing. That's the defining act that points to Jesus as the uh, Messiah, the divine Messiah. It is, the, it is the event that the Jews were looking for. It is the event that the Jews themselves would recognize as the fulfillment of prophecy. And for us Gentiles, it is the same act upon which our faith is, is based. When somebody says to me, why, in the end, why do you believe? And I, it's always this, because my Lord has resurrected. That's, that's why I believe. So now that this fact has been established, there remains one last act for the king to do. He now grants a commission or an authority to his apostles to proclaim the king's message throughout the world. And the commission and message are the following. In Matthew chapter 28, verses, uh, whoops, there we go. Matthew 28, he says, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So what does he do? Well, first of all, he gives them the authority to speak with authority. They have authority to speak with authority. Secondly, they're to proclaim his rulership as king and his offer of salvation as the Messiah. Thirdly, they're to proclaim the way into the kingdom. How do you enter into the kingdom? Through faith demonstrated or expressed through obedience. That's the way in, that's how you come in. And He promises to be with them until the end, which He has already talked about in Matthew 24, 25. It's important for Him to say that. Remember in Matthew 24, 25, He's talking about the end of the world there in, in a certain passage. It's going to be difficult and so on and so forth. So He says, don't worry, I'll be with you all the way to the end of time. Not only the end of time at the end of time, but also the end of Jerusalem. Because for them, that was, that was going to be something that happened in most of their lifetimes, the destruction of Jerusalem. So this is the message that we are charged with today, right? Same message that we have today, Matthew 28, 18 
to 20. So this is our commission, given to us by the king of the kingdom. And we know that he is the king of the kingdom because through the witness of the apostles, through their eyes, we have seen the resurrection of Jesus. No other religious leader has ever resurrected from the dead. No other religious leader or prophet even claims such a thing. They've claimed some pretty fantastic things, that they've seen God and that they've heard God or that God has given them you know, a special revelation, golden plates, golden bowls, whatever. You know, they, all kinds of claims that they've made. But no one has ever claimed to be resurrected from, from the dead. Only Jesus, only He has made that claim. So that's our commission. He's our King. He's our King. And this is, this is our authority. We have the, you know, who gives you the right? You know, when people say, who gives you the right to tell me this is how to get to heaven and this is, be careful, this, is, this way leads to destruction. Who gave you that authority? And the answer to that is, well, Jesus gave me this authority. Because as His disciple, He said to me, go into all the world and you know, preach the gospel. Some do it full time, like myself and Marty and others. Others do it in the way that they can, whether they invite people to church or they pass out tracts or they, you know, whatever, or they share their faith at the office or whatever, invite people to church. Everybody has a way of sharing their faith. But I want us to understand that we have the authority given to us by the Lord to do this thing. And it doesn't matter if other people say, oh, you don't have that authority, you have no right. Well, let them say that. But the Lord tells us we do have that right. And the gospel is our message. I know that there are a lot of messages out there. You know, probably the one most repeated in more books and TV shows is, of course, uh, um, be true to yourself, follow your heart, you know, which, which is very dangerous to follow your heart. Because why? Because the, the Lord says, out of the heart comes all the evil, <laughs> right? Yeah, out of the heart comes all the evil. So the gospel is our message to proclaim. And faith is obedience, that is our response. And you have the authority to say to someone else, you need to obey the gospel. Not for my sake, but for the Lord's sake. And it's okay to say, you need to think about this. You, you need to consider this. This is very important. And finally, Jesus will be with us in this work. I put in my notes in this work, but I change it now that I'm saying it out loud. Jesus will be with us in life. You know, not just in, quote, ministry, he is in ministry, of course, but in life. You know, we're going to have a picnic this afternoon. Well, Jesus will be with us as we enjoy that issue, as we enjoy that activity better. And Jesus is with us as we worship, of course. But Jesus is with us as we care for our children and grandchildren, and he's with us at work, and he's with us as we sleep. And when we wake up, as, in, as new Christians sometimes, that's a little bit uh, unnerving to think that the Lord is always with us, always uh, conscious of what we think and what we want and what our heart feels and so on and so forth. But as we grow in the spirit and as we mature, that becomes a great comforting thing, that the Lord is always with us. And how do we know this? Well, He, he promised, He promised that He would be with us. It's so wonderful to be able to quote the scripture when we say something to someone. I, I've, um, I've uh, you know, uh, been there when many uh, Christians have been very ill and when they've passed away or been close to dying. And I can say with confidence to a man or a woman, a brother and sister in Christ who's close to death, don't be afraid, the Lord is with you. And, and, and don't be afraid that maybe your, your wife will leave perhaps to go home and change, to come back to your bedside and, and maybe the nurse has already taken care of you and she's doing her rounds over here and the doctor hasn't come yet and, you're, you know, and your children have visited but they're gone and for a moment there you're alone. Because I've heard people say, I, I don't want to die alone and so we set up a vigil making sure there's a body next to them, you know, half asleep or not, 24-7. And that's okay, I mean, that's, that's fine, I'm not, I'm not knocking that. But we need to remember that 
Well, we're never alone. Never, ever alone. A brother and sister, never alone. Even if all the bodies leave just, just to go down the hallway to get a cup of coffee. You know, the Lord said, I'll be with you right to the end. And who do you think brings us across from life to death to life? None of us have the power to step over from life to death to life. Only Jesus has that. Only the angels know the way out of here into the next life. So we should take comfort in that idea where Jesus says, and lo, I'm with you always. That should be a very comforting thought. Well, that's the end of our Matthew, King of the Kingdom series. I want to thank you all for uh, sticking with it. We are dismissed for this class. Thank you very much for your attention. God bless you.